Well, hey everybody, thanks for stopping by. If you're bored, pull up a chair, hang out, and I'll show you what I'm doing in the hangar. Well, the first thing you might notice is that I have rearranged my hanger. My cruiser used to be on the left side of the hanger where the pits is at now. So I've moved the cruiser over to this side of the hanger. The pits used to be facing backwards back there behind the Super Duty. And I've moved it up front here so that it can now be pulled out of the hanger and fly. Or I have a guy coming up on Friday that may buy this airplane, so it may be gone on Friday. And then I've moved the Super Duty back here so that I can work on finishing up the engine and some other things. And I've made myself a nice little workshop area back here. I have my two workbenches arranged in sort of an L shape. And then I also have these two workbenches here. This one here and this workbench here. This wooden model right here, the wing is cracked on the bottom and I was gonna throw it in the garbage, but I decided to hang it on my wall instead. So it looks pretty cool. Now actually what I'm working on right now is the annual condition inspection on the cruiser. It's due in May, today's April 30th, so it'll get done in May, but I have 12 days off in a row, so I figured this would be a great time to completely get this, this airplane done and, and flying again. And the condition inspection pretty much is, is complete. I've looked at pretty much everything else so far. I checked the cable tensions on the rudder and the elevator cables. I've polished all the aluminum up with my flits, Although I haven't done the gear legs yet, I'll do those later. Um, but everything's pretty much done except firewall forward. What I'm waiting on right now is I ordered eight new spark plugs. So once I get those spark plugs, I'll put the spark plugs in and then I can reattach the baffles on both sides and uh, button this up and it's ready to go. So it'd be nice to get this thing back done and flying again. And then uh, I am working on the Super Duty and I'll show you what I'm doing on there next. All right, a few of the things I'm working on well, we'll start with the firewall forward. I'm still working on these baffles. And if you take a look at this pilot side baffle here, you'll notice the curve that's on there. What I've done is I've traced the curve from this side onto here and I've cut it out. And I'll put a picture on the screen of how this one was before. You'll see that it was a lot more squared off. So now it's curved, but this curve right here doesn't match the curve of the cowling, so it will have to be trimmed again. And I think it's a little bit too high, so I just have to kind of get the cowling fit on here and determine exactly where to cut this. But I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to have to cut probably about an inch or so off of the whole top here. Um, so that's kind of coming up next. I also trimmed this front little piece here. I think I showed on a previous video, for some reason this piece was about three-eighths of an inch higher than this one. So now this is all level, just like uh, this side. That, that came uh, like that, that was really nice. The other one was just, I don't know, it was off for some reason. And I'll show you one of the other things I am working on. Well, let me go on this side because I can show you my throttle cable and my mixture cable. So I wanted to get this stuff done. And if you remember on a previous video, I had this clamp to the engine mount right here. This is where it, it gets clamped and secured. And then some people are saying like when the engine moves, it could change the throttle, which is possible. Um, so I, I took that clamp off, but I have a feeling that's pretty much the only way to do this so that I can determine. And even if the engine does move, I mean, I can move this a little bit and it's not really making any difference up here. And I think the only time the engine's going to move is maybe during a start. Um, but I don't know, we'll see. Once I get this on, I'll see if there's some kind of bracket somewhere. Like technically this should be attached to the engine. So no matter how the engine moves, the, the throttle isn't moving. Um, but there's just nowhere to attach this on the engine. So we'll kind of figure that part out later. Now my Nick mixture cable, this just comes as a, a, a certain length and you have to cut it. And I had to cut about two feet or maybe not quite two feet, maybe about 18 to 20 inches off of this outer jacket here. And to cut this, you have to pull the inner wire back, obviously, so you don't cut through this wire. And I'll show you what happened when I did that. So I came in the airplane and I grabbed my mixture control and I just, I pulled it out enough to where I could cut that outer jacket. 
but now I can't get it back together. As you can see here, it, uh, this piece doesn't lock in here anymore. And you'll notice there's a little hole right here, and there's a little, where's my, there it is. You know, it's probably never gonna focus on there, but yeah, you can see on the end there how it's, it's cut out. I think there was supposed to be a ball bearing or something in here that held this in. And I think when I pulled it out, it fell out. And I just didn't even realize there, there was something in there. But I have looked all over the entire airplane for a little ball bearing or something, and I can't find anything. And I didn't see anything or hear anything come out of there. So I'm not quite sure how this is actually held together. If you guys know, if you've ever taken one of these apart, <laughs> leave a comment and let me know because the only thing I know right now is I'm probably going to have to buy a new mixture cable. And these things aren't cheap. I think they're like 150 bucks or something like that. So I don't really want to buy a new one, but I may have ruined this one. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention about this engine install is it's taken me forever because I have no idea how to install a Lycoming engine. Lycoming gives you zero instructions on anything. They don't even tell you what any of the sensors are. They just tell you nothing about the engine at all. And because Zenith builds these airplanes for so many different kinds of engines, there's really no instructions from Zenith on how to install this. So I wound up buying this book here. It's from the EAA. I got it on Amazon. It's, it's used, but it's in perfect condition. But it's called Firewall Forward. And uh, I actually just got it, so I really haven't even started looking at it yet. But um, hopefully it's gonna give me some idea on how to do things like secure that throttle cable and, and you know just some of all this other stuff that I really don't have any experience doing. You know, I've built three airplanes previous to this. I built two RANS airplanes in this cruiser. Both of the RANS airplanes had a Rotax 912 in it. And both Rotax and RANS had very good instructions on how to install those engines. So it was, it was no issue at all installing those engines. And then even on the, the cruiser, the UL Power came with awesome instructions on how to install and wire the engine. And I, I can't remember actually offhand if Zenith had instructions with it too. They may have come with their firewall forward, but I, I don't remember any difficulty at all installing the engine in the cruiser. Um, those, those three airplanes went really smoothly. But with this airplane and being a Lycoming engine, I've never installed a Lycoming before. And there's just so many things I just don't know how to do. And that's what's kind of taking forever. It's not just coming in the hangar and getting to work doing things. It's just, if I find most of the time I'm just sitting here staring at it like this, trying to figure out where to start or what to do. So I'm hoping this book will kind of get me going down the right track and um, get me some good information I can use to, to get this finished up. Now, one thing that's helped me a lot with this engine install is working with people like Steve at Aircraft Specialty. Uh, that's the company that makes all of the hoses in, on this airplane, all the, the fuel lines, the oil lines, the brake lines, everything on here is from Aircraft Specialty, and they do a fantastic job. They're all steel braided lines. Everything firewall forward comes pre-fire sleeved. You know, notice this is the real nice new style fire sleeve where it's, it fits tight on the hose. So it was really nice using his experience to help me kind of design these fuel and oil hose systems. We do have these available as a, uh, a ready to install kit on kitplayenthusiast.com if you guys want to order those. But do remember one thing, when you order these kits, say like the, um, the brake line kit or the, the fuel line kit, you do have to, the hose is already cut to a certain length and are designed to fit the same way I installed mine. So you do have to mount your fuel selector at the same place I did. And if you're doing the brake lines, like you need to mount the parking brake valve at the same location I did. And I have videos on my channel that explain where I mounted everything so you can see those and, and you know, mount them in the same location. We did have one guy that bought the, the fuel line kit, but he mounted his fuel selector valve in a different location. And that's perfectly fine, but just know that the hoses may not fit if you move things because they're, they're pre-cut to fit this particular installation. If you guys want custom hoses, if you want to move things around and do it your own way, that's perfectly fine. Just give Steve a call or an email at Aircraft Specialty. And uh, I think all he'll need is the length of the hoses and then like what kind of ends you want on them and stuff like that. And then he'll get you, uh, you know, all your hoses built for you. So I always appreciate working with Steve. I just wanted to give him a shout out because he's been a huge help with me getting this installed. All right, guys, you know, I'm not afraid to tell you when I screw something up and I've, 
I screw up more stuff than, it, than, than I care to even admit. It's, just, it's unbelievable with how many airplanes I've built and how many I've worked on that I still screw things up. But you'll notice I have no rudder cables anymore. They are laying on a, in a heap on the floor. <laughs> Let me tell you how I screwed this one up. If we look at this page in the plans where it explains the rudder cable routing, even though I looked at this page a number of times, I completely missed this right here. And I don't know that I missed it or just didn't pay close enough attention to it. But anyway, I'll show you in the plane. It, it goes through these two holes. There's a hole right there and a hole right here. And this big thing right here is a nylon block. Well, I had these, the rudder pedals are up here. So you're looking at the rudder pedals here. They cross over, they come through these holes and go back. I had mine, they crossed over, but I completely missed these two holes. I had them sitting on top of, of here. I'll show you that in the plane. What I've done is I've already removed the rudder cables. I already cut them out. Um, so I just have these blue tubes in here to show you. But if I can use my elbow to move the stick over. So here's how my rudder cables were. They were right up next to the stick on, on both sides like that, rubbing on the stick. And then when I moved the stick like left and right, it would bend those rudder cables. But you see this thing right here. That's They were sitting above this metal right here. If I can move that out of the way, you can kind of see this is where they were routed just like this. And from this side of the airplane, you can see here, the rudder cables were up here like that. Now they're supposed to go in this hole right here and then there's a hole on the other side. So they start from these tabs on the rudder pedals right there and they, they cross over up front and they switch around. They go through these holes and back. Well, I had mine crossing over and then sitting up on, on top of here. And they were also rubbing on this metal too, which I thought, well, that's not good either. <laughs> so, and I still didn't see these holes here, even though, like I said, I double checked the plans. All right, I wanna give Zenith a shout out too, specifically Roger at Zenith for the great customer support. Uh, I had emailed him yesterday with some pictures showing him how the rudder cables were uh, rubbing on the control stick. And I said, I even double checked the plans. Everything's routed correctly. I don't know why this is doing this. And then he FaceTimed me today and I was showing him my cables and then he was showing me the cables on their Super Duty. And that's when I realized like, oh, wait a minute, yours are going under there and there's going through holes that I completely missed. <laughs> so uh, thanks Roger for, for solving this problem for me. What I did have to do though, is I had to cut out the rudder cables because once you swage on those little loops at the end, uh, they don't, those loops don't fit through uh, those, the holes in the block. So I had to cut out my rudder cables and then call Zenith back and order 40, 40 more feet of rudder cable. <laughs> so now when I get that rudder cable in, I have to rebuild my rudder cables. But hey, at least that problem is solved and I can move on. Now one last thing I'll show you on the airplane itself is I've been working on my, on this piece here and I had my intercom jacks right there. But what I noticed was there's so many wires I have in here with the autopilot and everything. And then at those wires coming back and having all those wires and the headset jacks right here, uh, those wires were kind of rubbing on, on the, the rudder cable that was coming out of there and here. There wasn't a lot of room for them back there. So I figured I might as well change the location of where I have my jacks. And what I'll do here is I'm just gonna, I was thinking I can, I can just make a new piece here, order a new one, uh, but this one's already primed and, and painted and ready to go. Um, I'm just gonna cut a little access cover here, maybe put a hinge in the back so it can flip up for an inspection or something, but I'll use this same piece, cover that hole. But what I've done is I've moved my headset jacks up to here uh, on, the, on this uh, bulkhead and they're in the same location on the passenger side also. So those, all those cables now, you can't really, it's these ones right here, these white shielded cables, they come down and instead of going back there and interfering with everything, they just come into here and then uh, you can see the jacks right there. Obviously I have to rewire them, but uh, this is a good location for them. In fact, I even sat in my cruiser with my headset on and put the cord down here to see if it was in the way. And it's, it's really not in the way at all. So I figured this is a good location for them. 
it just frees up some wire in the tunnel here and works just as well. So that's one other little thing I got done. Now I didn't think it was ever, ever going to happen, but we actually are starting to get some nice warm weather in Michigan. And that means I can get back to painting. Now I have eight pieces I have to paint. There's the slats and the flapperons, a left and a right, and each one has two pieces. So there's eight pieces total. And what I've done is I've been trying to figure out how to paint these so I can do them all at once. Not all the pieces at once, but each piece I can do the whole thing at one time without having to let one side dry and flip it over. And I made a jig similar to this when I was painting the flapperons on the cruiser. And what you can see here is I have a, uh, the outboard slat section ready for paint. And what I can do with how it's sitting in the jig here, I can paint the, the, what would be the back side of it. And while that's wet, I can rotate it up like this and then paint the top and then uh, do the same thing for the second coat. But this just lets me uh, be able to paint this whole piece at once, let it sit in the booth for a couple days to cure, take it out, put the next one in, and then paint that one. I've got to do this, well actually I have to do this 12 times now because I have eight pieces, but four of them still need primer. So I've got a lot of work to do now that the weather is nice, but it will be nice to get these um, completely primed and painted and then installed on the airplane. And then at that point, it's really just finishing up the engine install. Because once the engine is installed, I can run the engine, make sure everything's wired correctly, and then put that glare shield on. And like I said, the windshield and the doors and all that stuff is ready just to bolt on. I just don't have them on there now because they'd be in the way. So. I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel for this airplane, and I'm still hoping to get it flying this summer. All right, guys, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for hanging out for a while. Now get your ass out of here because I've got some work to do. 